The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next presenter is uh, Mary Christensen from Michigan Tech, and she's going to talk on waste glass for use in geopolymers. And the next three talks that we have on are on geopolymers, so buckle up. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Christensen. I'm from Michigan Tech, and uh, I've been doing some research on um, glass uh, used in geopolymers as he just said. Uh, so I'll go over real basically uh, a little bit about geopolymers. Um, Dr. Preempton also uh, spoke on them uh, by a different name, I guess, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, what's desirable in a source material and then why I think that glass is a desirable source material to make geopolymers, uh, and uh, a little bit about waste glass as a material. And then I made some mortars and uh, did a little bit of analysis. Uh, this is also research in progress, so uh, just to kind of give you an idea about uh, how glass performs in a geopolymer uh, system. So what is a geopolymer? A uh, binder results from the alkali activation of an aluminosilicate source. Typically has a significantly smaller carbon footprint uh, than OPC. Uh, Dr. Preempton explained that pretty well. Um, and in many cases is, is capable of similar or increased um, performance in terms of mechanical and durability properties. Um, of course, this is a case-by-case -case basis, and some geopolymers are better than others. Um, so very basically, uh, the way that geopolymerization works uh, is you take a, a very fine aluminosilicate source and put it in a caustic solution, and the hydroxyl ions from that solution, which in my case is a sodium hydroxide, uh, the hydroxyl ions attack the silica oxygen or alumina oxygen bonds in the uh, source material and pull out those silica and alumina monomers into solution. And once uh, the concentration uh, reaches a certain point, those monomers, which are hydrolyzed, become uh, condensed together in a condensation reaction where two hydroxyl groups will join together to form uh, an oxygen bridge and then release a water molecule. And so the idea is to uh, get a very, very fine material with a very reactive uh, source of silica and alumina and then put it in a very uh, high pH system. And you want this to happen really fast. Um, so uh, you want uh, dissolution as well as the polycondensation to happen really fast. And if it happens fast enough, then the uh, monomers will turn into dimers and trimers, et cetera, and, until you get larger species and you get a complete connectivity of your system, and then uh, upon hardening, you have a, a nice sort of monolithic binder. Uh, so that's, that's uh, very basically how it works with sodium hydroxide. Um, as Dr. Preempton noted, uh, changing the activator changes a lot of pretty much everything. Um, so as I said, uh, when you're looking at potential source materials, uh, you need a lot of silica and alumina, and you need that to be available, uh, and that's typically uh, found in an amorphous structure, so in a glass, uh, a glassy material with uh, vitreous phases, um, or a calcine material. Um, if you take uh, kaolinite clay and, and, and heat it, you know you get you kind of disrupt the order of the structure, and that increases the uh, reactivity of that material. Uh, you also typically want something that's sort of homogeneous that just makes things uh, easier in terms of mixed design and also trying to predict what you're going to get out of this in the end. Uh, and typically you want your material to be hard because um, from what I've found and what I've read, complete dissolution is very rare or hard to get to, sort of. And so you have uh, a lot of particles that are unreacted left. And if they're soft like clay, 
then you have sort of a weak, weak spots in your matrix. So if you have a hard material, it sort of acts as a, a microaggregate, such as the flash particles or glass particles. Uh, so this probably looks really familiar. Um, mostly these are supplementary cementitious materials, uh, and, and a lot of the requirements are, are very similar to what will work in an OPC system as what will work in a, in a geopolymer system. But mainly uh, we want to focus on the, those materials rich in silicon and alumina. Um, so these are the materials that I actually used in, my, in this study. Uh, this is a, a Class C fly ash, pretty typical composition. Um, it has a high alkali content there. But if you compare that to bottle glass or typical soda lime glass, you can see right away that there's a higher silica content and a much, much lower alumina content. And um, as I said, silica and alumina are both important, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so that's sort of the point of, uh, of my research here. So why is alumina important? Um, you can see from this little graphic here on the right, the, uh, the silica is tetrahedrochlorate tetrahedrally coordinated, right? So is alumina in, in a basic uh, solution. However, alumina is a trivalent cation, meaning it has a plus three charge. So if it acts like silica and is tetrahedrally coordinated, you get a net negative one charge. However, the sodium ions are often friendly enough to just kind of hang out with the alumina ions to balance that charge. And so when you have your uh, network of geopolymer, you have your alumina ions balanced with a sodium cation. And so you typically want your sodium to alumina ratio to be close to one, a little bit higher, maybe. Um, and then in terms of the silica to alumina ratio, molar ratio, uh, the uh, amount of alumina has been shown to in fact impact set time, microstructure, uh, compressive strength, many, many other, um, uh, like kinetics for sure. So um, you can argue with me if you want on what the ideal uh, stoichiometry for a flash or metacalin geopolymer is, but if you look at glass, we're way, way high compared to those two. So, um, something to think about. Uh, so while I have your attention, I'm just going to give a little plug for glass here. Um, this is a sign from Houghton. Uh, we can't recycle glass there because we're too far away from the nearest color processing plant, and that was sort of part of the motivation for this project, just that there's a lot of glass out there. Uh, so the municipal solid waste stream in 2010 a little less than 5%, um, so it's out there. And glass supposedly is 100% recyclable, can be recycled endlessly with no loss or in quality or purity. I think most of us would agree with that or have heard that before. Uh, however, this is the, the current situation. So this is uh, glass recovery in the United States over the last 50 years. And you can see that um, we're kind of plateaued at around 30%. And the reason for that is the uh, glass manufacturers, from what I've read and heard, really want to use waste glass. However, um, when it's collected curbside or single stream recycled uh, through single stream recycling, the impurities, both color and contaminants, are just way too much for them to mess with. And um, so if you, you know, people drop their coffee cup in the morning and they're like, oh, I think this is kind of glassy, and then they throw it in <laughs> glass recycling, that melts at a way higher temperature and can wreak havoc on their machinery. And so uh, they kind of don't want a piece of it. And so there are markets for glass in the U.S., but as you can see, nothing major. We have a lot of glass, uh, or a fair amount of glass, that's not being recovered. So I used some of it to make some mortars. Um, this was just uh, some preliminary work I did looking at uh, particle size. The fine glass had a 3 to 4 micron uh, median size, and the coarse, uh, I believe, was around 45 microns. And then I looked at a 5 molar and a 10 molar sodium hydroxide and then uh, cured them for 24 hours at 40 or 80 degrees. And I'll just report on the compressive strength here, but I'm sure if I polled any one of you, you would say probably the one that had the finest glass and the highest concentration and the highest strength or the highest uh, curing temperature would give the highest strength, and that was what we found um, because those are all conditions conducive to rapid dissolution and rapid uh, polycondensation. So you can see here, the blue ones are fine, uh, so the fineness was very important, as was the curing temperature in particular. Uh, and here's just a picture of uh, what the microstructure kind of looks like. There's a really large piece of glass there, looks like a piece of glass. So what I did was uh, I wanted to add in an alumina source to my glass to see if I could um, bring those stoichiometric numbers kind of down to where normal geopolymers are. Um, however, uh, I found out that the glass I've been using actually has a significant amount of alumina in it, um, and I kind of, kind of got duped by the glass guy. But um, he gave me a low alkali glass, so 
I kind of had a reverse of what bottle glass is, so you can note here that uh, the glass I'm using is not typical soda line glass. However, my future work will be. But I think the, uh, the same trends probably are similar. So I made five mixes. Um, 100G means 100% glass. And then I uh, replaced 25 and 50% with metacanlin and a Class C fly ash. And so I came up with these, uh, this range of silica to alumina ratios and sodium to alumina. Um, and I marked off the one there, which is uh, kind of what the goal was. Uh, I should mention, too, that if anyone's worked with metacalin, it's really not very fun at all to try to mix. Um, and up on the right-hand corner there, those are equal amounts of uh, uh, activator and, and material uh, mixed for two minutes. The one on the right is glass, and the one on the left is metacalin. So um, I worked for to try to get a similar flow between all my mixes, and I had to increase the water... Uh, water to solids ratio kind of substantially for the, especially the 50% metacalin mix. So you can see there that uh, had a lot more voids and so. Uh, so we looked at compressive strength at one, three, and seven days. And um, you can tell right away from the microstructure, I think, that uh, the 75% uh, the uh, glass, 25% metacalin mix actually had the highest compressive strength. And you can see from the microstructure that it looks a lot more uh, uniform and uh, kind of more solid. But the 50-50 mix was just a, a mass of aggregated little pieces of geopolymer and uh, uh, zeolites and unreacted glass and uh, metacalin. And so I'm not really sure, but it was uh, it's kind of a sad day when you make, make a mortar and you can crumble it in your hands, and <laughs> that stuff was kind of like that. Um, but uh, So that's what they kind of look like. And then I also uh, did some uh, backscatter work uh, looking at the uh, section of the five different mixes. Um, and this is the 100% glass. You can see very clearly the reaction rim around the uh, glass particles. And then in the right, I just put a, a, threw up some pictures of the zeolites that were formed because they were pretty cool looking uh, and, and, and varied in all the different mixes. But uh, here is the mix that actually ended up with the highest compressive strength, and that reaction rim around the glass is missing. Um, and to me, this one looks like it would be stronger than this one, but this one ended up being... Uh, this is the 50-50 metacalin mix, and there's not a whole lot there holding anything together. Um, the zeolites were cubic, I think zeolite A, that is. The flyish mixes look pretty good, but again, they didn't really have the kind of strength that the, the higher uh, glass mixes did. Um, and then as you add more uh, flyash, a little bit less, uh, less density in the microstructure. Uh, so as I said, this is totally a work in progress, um, but I, I do think that uh, glass is a viable material to be used for geopolymers and that uh, materials such as metacalin or fly ash or uh, red mud, there's a whole lot of other materials out there that are rich in alumina that can be coupled with the glass to kind of bring the stoichiometry down to where we, or where much of the literature uh, says it should be. Um, and then I, I also should note that the, the bulk stoichiometry, which is all I reported on here, which is what you start with, is of course very different than what you end up with in the in the geopolymer, uh, and that has a lot to do with the degree of reaction and what phases are formed, uh, if any. Um, so the highest compressive strength, I found that the sodium to alumina ratio was one. I don't really think this is conclusive that that is the reason, um, but you know definitely something I'm looking into more. Um, and I'm also doing some work on looking at the water to solids ratio because in the literature, uh, many people say it doesn't really matter that much, but. I kind of wonder if that's why my 50% metacalin uh, literally fell apart. So um, that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions for me? Close my eyes on CBM. Great presentation. Thank you. And um, what about boards? So sometimes I use board. Uh, borates in the manufacturer glass with that? Like in Pyrex type stuff? The borosilicate glass? Borosilicate. Yeah, um, well, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but I've read uh, they're using, uh, many people are using geopolymers to try to lock up uh, heavy metals, and I believe when I looked, um, they've been able to kind of supposedly lock in pretty much everything, and I believe boron was one of the, uh, the elements that was able to be kind of locked into the matrix. Are you worried about leaching, you mean? Or, oh, expansion, or... Changing of the changing of uh, the kinetics. Just oh, the kinetics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sure that that would that would maybe play a role. Um, the glass that I'm hoping to be working with is packaging glass, and that makes up about 80% uh, of all the glass that is uh, recycled. 
uh, or put into the municipal solid waste stream. So I would guess that the that would be sort of a low concentration, but definitely something to look into. Just, just a comment: the uh, the uh, in the the kaolin because it's, it's uh, high fibers. Yeah. Even twenty five percent is probably on the high end. Typically, yeah. Right. Well, right. People have, uh, there's a lot of literature about there about 100% metacalin geopolymers and uh, mixtures between flash and metacalin with high volumes of metacalin, so right. I uh, agree. Those situations, probably they have uh, admixtures. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. They have good it doesn't appear that you have admixtures. No, I didn't want to go down that road, but this yeah. Okay. Good thing. Thank, thank you. How available are the alkalis from glass uh, I think, I mean, I th as far as uh, glass dissolution, I believe the alkalis are the first thing to come out. So as the glass uh, dissolves, the alkalis would be free to come out. There are no more questions. Thank you once again.